slow to hear us. Listen, Lord, we lift our voices to you in praise. Call on the name of the Lord, all people. Listen, Lord, we call on your wonderful name, for you saved us, you raised us, and you turned our lives around. Come on with me. Let your name be praised, for we can do all things through you who gives us strength to do the work you have called us to do. Let us pray. Eternal God who made flesh, into the peace of our, your presence we bring your restlessness, our restless lives. Down through the ages, people have sought you and found that your faithfulness has no end. Your people have long journeyed by your guidance and rested on your love. Refresh our faith, restore our confidence, and lay your guiding hand on our lives. We pray in the name of Jesus the Christ, amen. We invite you for a moment of silent prayer and meditation. Amen. This afternoon, we are so proud and humbled that uh, Reverend Dr. Harold Dean Trulier has come our way, who has been spending some time with us for the last couple of days as we have launched a partnership, a collaboration with the Tennessee Higher Ed Initiative in the prison system where we're going behind the walls and not only training individuals um, through uh, head knowledge, but also heart knowledge. We are providing the restorative justice portion of that training in the Turner Center, as well as down in the center down in West Tennessee. So this afternoon, we have Reverend Dr. Trulier with us, uh, who is indeed an ordained Baptist preacher. He served as, a, as the Associate Professor of Applied Theology at Howard University School of Divinity since 2003. He currently teaches prophetic ministry uh, along with some ethics courses and criminal justice courses. And uh, he is indeed a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Morehouse College and uh, received with distinction his PhD degree, for a PhD degree from Drew University, as well as has offered several publications regarding high risk use, as well as the church and uh, re entry and reform. It is our pleasure to have him with us here today. Dr. Trulia also serves as the director of Healing, Minist Healing Communities, uh, and we are so excited that not only did we have him here, but he's also named as one of the 14 faith leaders to watch by the Center for American Progress. Dr. Trulia is one that is indeed a prophetic professor, preacher, that proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ through a restorative justice lens. May you indeed turn your hearts and your ears to hear what thus saith the Lord to us from Reverend Dr. Harold Trulier. Dr. Trulier. Thank you, Reverend Harvey. Good morning. It's an honor and a privilege to be with you on this morning. 
this afternoon, uh, it's morning somewhere, uh, and I'm grateful to the for the uh, invitation from Reverend Talbert. Um, Reverend Talbert was a student in some classes I taught at Payne Seminary, and one of the reasons that I accepted the invitation was it, it, when, when I see my students doing well, I feel like maybe I'm doing something right. So this is kind of a selfish validation for me to be here on today. I want to turn our attentions to the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. The Apostle Paul is speaking, not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Lord, your word, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else in Jesus' name, amen. Living between expectation and experience. Living between expectation and experience. Paul is in jail. That was not his expectation, but it was his experience. Paul is locked up. Paul is in prison. Paul is in chains. This was not the way Paul expected things to go. When you go back through the biographical sections of his epistles, you see that he had a different trajectory in mind for his life, for his profession, for his calling. From the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, father of prominent leader within the synagogue, studied under Gamaliel. Paul expected to be a leader among the Pharisees. He expected to be a leader among the Jews, and, and now he's in prison. Uh, something happened on his way to destiny. You know, that, that is what life is. It's full of detours on the way to destiny. Uh, but the good thing about a detour is if the person who is supervising the construction, who is supervising the detour, is doing his or her job, they put signs up that make sure that you are routed back to the road to destiny. And this, this may be a detour, but there are signs that, that, that point him back on the road to destiny. But meanwhile, uh, he's on a detour. Uh, there is a detour called experience on the road to destiny. I, sometimes people don't believe that, but, but all I, what I say to them is all you have to do is ask someone who's been married, and they'll tell you there's a gap between experience and expectation. When ask anyone who said, I do, what their expectations were on that day. Ask them what their experience has been since then, and maybe they would have shifted their expectations. But, but there is a gap between expectation and experience. I, I, I work in prisons, I work in jails, and I, I meet men and women across the country, and none of them had a trajectory where they expected their destiny to be a dungeon. None of them expected that this was where they were going to end up. Now, the society may have thought that way. The society may have looked at their color and may have looked at their gender and said, oh, we've got a cell for you. But, 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 but they did not have that expectation for themselves. I did not have that expectation when I ended up in the George W. Hill Correctional Facility as inmate number 10002648. That was not my expectation, but it was my experience. And so how do you live in that space? How do you live in that gap? Paul, Paul tells us how he did it. Paul tells us how he handled his time in prison. He says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, we have to qualify that because 
there are Christians who take that verse out of context and make it into a divine blank check. They, they, they take that as being divine license to do whatever it is that they think God has called them to do. Uh, but it can't mean that. If it, if, if it meant that, it meant you could fly a plane. You get on an airplane and you hear the pilot. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. Please fasten your seatbelt and pay attention to the exit line signs and all that other good stuff. And by the way, uh, I've never been to flight school. I've never flown a plane before. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, you, you, you get off the plane. Uh, chap, I see you over there. You up there in the hospital. Now, if the doctor came up to you on the gurney and said, I'm not a doctor, but I, I play one on TV, and, and I, I, I got the surgery anointing, hallelujah, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You, you get up off the, the gurney. You get, you get out of there. You smack the anesthesiologist on your way out. It's, it's not a blank check. It, it, it's, it's a reference to the fact that Paul has been through some experiences. He's been through some stuff, and, and, and over the years, he says, I have learned how to be a base. I have learned how to abound. I, I've learned how to have plenty. I've learned how to be in want. Jesus has been with me thus far through, through many dangers, toils, and snares. I have already come, and my, my, my experience tells me that though this was not what I expected, that I can handle this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He had more help than just the God in him. He also had the church. One of the reasons I do what I do is I'm trying to get church folk to help folks who are going through the criminal justice system. Here's Paul, he's in jail, and he tells the church at Philippi, thank you for making sure I was being taken care of. The church did not turn their back on Paul. The church did not Ignore Paul. The church did not pretend Paul did not exist. You know how we do. Oh, I haven't seen your son lately. Oh, uh, he's up north. I haven't seen your daughter lately. Oh, she's in school. When they're really in prison or jail. We, 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 we're so shamed. But Paul rejoices because the church of Philippi was not ashamed of his chains. When you want to go through a jail experience, when you want to go through experience that doesn't meet your expectation, you need someone to walk with you. You need someone to encourage you. You need someone to pray for you. You need someone to speak into you. And the church at Philippi did that for Paul. I wish churches did that. I, uh, churches, they, they remind me of one of my students at, at Howard University. She said, Doc, I know that you love all those prisoners, but I, I couldn't deal with folks like that. I said, no. I said, well, I'm one of them. She said, oh, well, you're different. I said, no, I'm not different. She said, no, no, you know what I mean. You know what I mean. I, I just can't deal with, with those people. Those people. I said, can I borrow your Bible? She said, why? I said, well, this is seminary, Reverend Talbert, and one of the things they say seminary does is destroys the Bible, right? That's not what we say. So I, I, I took a Bible, I said, now, what, I said, now, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take out the book of Genesis. She said, why are you going to do that? I said, because Joseph is in there, and Joseph is one of those people, and if you can't deal with those people, we got to get rid of the book of Genesis. Yeah, yeah. Next thing we're going to do is get rid of the book of Jeremiah, because Jeremiah was in solitary confinement. If you can't get rid of those people, you got to get rid of the book of Daniel because Daniel was a two-time loser and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were on death row. If you can't deal with those people, you got to get rid of the book of Revelation because John wrote that while he was locked up. If you can't deal with those people, then you can't be reading the book of Philippians and tell folks, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because Paul was one of those people. And she said, oh, wait a minute, Doc, wait a minute, wait a minute. Those were good people. I'm talking about bad people. I said, so you mean like that musician? Got to watch those musicians. Because in the Bible, there was a musician who saw a beautiful woman. 
and he decided to write a song about her. He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I see what I want. He arranged to have her husband killed, put a hit on Uriah. Uh, that, that's conspiracy to commit murder. Yeah, yeah. Paul held the coats while they stoned Stephen. That's an accessory to murder. Yeah, yeah. Moses killed a man who was beating up his friend. That, that, that's murder, murder. Yeah. Peter would have been arrested. No, no, Peter wouldn't have been arrested. Peter pulled out a knife on a cop. If he had been living in 2021, or 2022, pulling a knife, oh my God, if they, if they will choke you for selling cigarettes in Staten Island, if they will shoot you with a toy gun in Cleveland, if they will shoot you with your hands in the air in Ferguson, Missouri, if they will shoot you while you're reaching for your wallet in Minnesota, then you know that Peter would have been down. Yeah. Why are we so ashamed of folks in prison we serve a God who died in custody. Maybe we're in the wrong religion. But the church at Philippi supported Paul. They were there for him. Because one of the ways you make it through the experiences on that detour on the way to destiny is to have a church that says, we will walk with you. A church that says, we will support you. A church that says, we will love you. A church that says, we forgive you. A church that believes in me while I'm gone. A church that will actually accept my tithe when I send it from the prison. I've seen churches saying, why is he tithing? He's not a member here anymore. He's in prison. Paul was supported by those who were part of the church in Philippi. Living between expectation and experience, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But there's a flip side to expectation and experience because sometimes the expectation is negative and the experience is positive. The expectation for young black men is that they're going to prison, but God saves them and makes them preachers. Even some of the ones that go to prison, he makes them preachers. The expectation is that trouble will last always and our slave foreparent saying, I'm so glad that trouble don't last always. Uh, there was an expectation on Calvary that the movement was over. There was an expectation on Calvary that Jesus was finished. There was an expectation on Calvary that there'd be no more trouble out of this Jewish sect. There was an expectation by those in high places that Jesus had been silenced, but the experience was on the third day, God raised him from the dead. I'm so glad that I'm not a captive to your expectations. I'm so glad I'm not a captive to Republican expectations. I'm so glad I'm not a captive to political expectations. I'm so glad I'm not a captive to racist expectations because my experience is there is a God who rules above with hand of power and heart of love. And if I'm right, he'll fight my battles and I shall have peace someday. The expectation was that Jesus was dead and gone, but the experience of his resurrection gives me hope today that I can live in the gap between expectation and experience. And so, Lord, today, we look at those men in prison like Paul, those that we think should be in prison like David. We look at those who walk the streets like Rahab. We look at those who are commit acts of violence like Peter. And it seems as though that's all they're ever going to be. But you said he who has begun a good work will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. And there are Pauls sitting in our prisons there are Jeremiah's sitting in our jails, waiting for someone to come alongside and help. 
whether an Ethiopian eunuch or a Philippian church, you've made sure that someone is alongside those who are incarcerated. And, and when they couldn't get there, you showed up in the gas chamber in Daniel and personally took care of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego while they are on death row. And so your care for the prisoner challenges us to not box them in by their experience, but to expect great things. You rescued us on our detours and you want to do the same for them. P.S. Lord, before I take my seat, there's someone here, maybe probably more than one, who has a family member that's locked up and you've been mourning, you've been mad, you've been going through your own stages of grief at their, their loss to the system. But Lord, you want them to know that there is still hope and that you can use even this awful experience to bring forth new expectation. Speak hope to that person's life right now in the name of Jesus, whether it's a son, a grandson, a spouse, a daughter, a granddaughter, a, a, a sibling, or a parent. Let them know that you're not finished. So glad that we're here. We're here today because when we thought we were done, you weren't finished. You're not finished. And that's how we can live in the gap between expectation and experience. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dr. Trulier, of allowing us to know how we can live in the experience and the gap and the space between expectation and experience, whether we are living in the prison of our own minds or behind prison walls. We invite you uh, to really uh, take, a, take a moment and take a, um, a look at the program that we are, an initiative that we're doing through our racial justice ministries headed by Dr. Reverend, I did it again, Reverend Kelly X. Uh, we are expanding our ministry into looking at transformative education in a way through racial justice with the Tennessee Higher Education Initiative in the prison system. We are going behind the walls and not only giving head knowledge, but also heart knowledge and hand for those to reach across the table for their families, for them all to be restored. We invite you to take a look at that program. We invite you to take a look at our programs that we have here at Scarrett Bennett. Go on our website at scarrettbennett.org. You will see that we have Tuesdays in the chapel every Tuesday at this time at 1230. We have Vespers every Sunday at 630. We invite you also to come share a meal with us any Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday for community uh, lunch. And on the fourth Sunday of the month, we invite you to come and share a dinner with us before Vespers. But please make sure you check us out. You do not want to miss our art exhibit that is being held right now. Uh, through, it is a beautiful exhibit for, uh, by Able Voices that's in our uh, Lasky gallery and on the second floor of the Lasky building. Again, we thank you for joining us for our moment of reflection and inspiration. And we invite you to come back again uh, to visit us. And we will have our closing benediction by Dr. Trulier. And now, Lord, as we go down from this place, 
Help us to remember that when we are in solidarity with the prisoner, we are in solidarity with you. Because you keep us both by your grace and your mercy. And it is unto you, the God who keeps us from falling, that we give all honor, praise, majesty, and dominion. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, amen.